Uh, in the book of Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs, it, um, it'll teach you something. God had me several years ago uh, reading the book of Proverbs. He said, read it. Now, so I read it. And I got done. I said, okay, Lord, what was that all about? And he said, read it again. I read it again. And, okay, Lord, and what, what was that? And I had to read it again. And about the third time through, it, it started, I, I began to notice that God had, he shows two women in the book of Proverbs. One of them is a wise woman. She is a, a beautiful woman. She, is, uh, she represents heaven. She represents a, a good church, a Bible-believing church. And um, the other is what the Bible calls a strange woman. And she has, she has different motives for what she does. So I want you to look in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now look at verse 8. Now just think about how the Bible words things and think about how right this is. My son, hear the instruction of thy father. That your father's going to tell you how to cut down trees and how to fix the radiator. and He's going to give you instruction on how to do things with your hands. Amen, boys? Amen. But then he said... Um, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Your mother is going to lay the law down. Amen to that. She's going to lay the law down. She's not going to. The only thing, really, my mother taught me right before I went to school, right before I went off to college, she taught me how to wash my clothes by myself. Taught me how to iron my britches and taught me how to separate this color from that color. And uh, I remembered that when I got to college. I just didn't care. I just threw them all in, washed them all at once, leave them in there for three or four days, hoping they'd dry themselves, which they did, but they smelled bad. And, uh, but anyway, it was the law of your mother. It's when your mother lays the law down and says, now this is how it's going to be, and who dares go against me? He said, don't forsake that. He said, for they shall be an ornament of grace under thy head and chains about thy neck. My mother said that she was going to wear it this morning when I was in, oh, probably first grade. Our teacher had us make out of paper clips and red tape these necklaces for our mothers for Mother's Day in school. And I took that home and was just as proud it looked like a ruby necklace made out of silver paper clips. My mom has kept that hanging on her dresser. The clips are not silver anymore. The tape is still on there. And usually when she comes for Mother's Day, she has that around her neck. That's good. So he says, these are going to be a, uh, they're going to be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. And then look at, look at the beginning of chapter 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver. Wisdom is personified as a mother in the Bible. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Wisdom and prudence and no-nonsense living is personified as your mother in the Scriptures. If thou criest after knowledge, lift up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So you just ponder that and think about that and pray about that. Now, turn over to... Um, Turn over to uh, Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. My son, attend to my wisdom. Bow thine ear to my understanding. You young men, you boys, you listen to this. That thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Now look at verse 3. Your mother is always going to be a good judge ladies or gentlemen, of who you should be with. 
She's smarter. She can smell them coming a mile away. She can tell a wolf a mile away. Your mom is going to be a good judge of character. After all, she married your daddy. Amen? My son, attend to my wisdom. Look at verse 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. A harlot woman, a strange woman, will say whatever you want to hear. That's churches that say whatever lost people want to hear. Amen? But her end is as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. This is, all, this, this is your mother trying to warn you about that huzzy that you're running around with, or those friends that you're hanging with. She's trying to tell you, don't be around those kids. Don't, be, don't hang around those people. Don't date that girl. Don't look after that boy. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are moved, thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, ye children, and depart not from, my wor from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, and say, How have I hated instruction in my heart? Uh, despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. And I like to listen, that last phrase there, you can be raised in church and have bad people in your youth steer you away from it. Is that not true? Somebody say amen. amen. So listen to your mother. She's trying to warn you. She's trying to protect you. She's trying to guide you. She may, hey, listen now. I believe, and, and when I talk about harlots and, and whores in the Bible and strange women like that, did you know that God knows how to save those people? Remember who Rahab the harlot was? She was a woman that spent her life and her, her job was taking in men. That was her job. She fed her family with it, but that was her job. And here, here comes these two spies and she saw them, but she knew who they were. And she knew that God was going to destroy that city. She knew that even though her life was filled with iniquity, she was asking God to save her soul. Did God save her? Yes. By the scarlet cord, that's a picture of the blood of Jesus Christ. God not only saved her, God made her famous. Not by way of her being a whore. But by way, if you read Matthew chapter 1, you will find her name listed as one of the grandmothers of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's sweet. That's beautiful. That's what God can do. So those people that your mama is trying to warn you about, it may be that she knows better than you think what they're capable of because you don't know where and how she used to run when she was your age. She hasn't told you all the stories. But she's been around the block and she knows it. And she's telling you, don't be around these people. Can I get an amen out of some people some, this morning? Somebody say amen. Now take your Bibles, turn to First Kings 21. That sermon was free. That's just an extra one that I'm going to throw in this morning, all right? But this next one's free too. 1 Kings chapter 21. Uh, it dawned on me, I've, I've been around the country and I preached this message. I preached it down in Harrison, Arkansas. I had it preached to me years ago. It was at uh, Liberty Faith Church down there, Brother Reg Kelly. It was, it was turnabout. I've had him come up here for a couple of things, come up here for a revival meeting, came up for our God, Guns, and Liberty Conference, and he called me when, when we come down a Sunday, and he had mentioned that maybe he'll have a little prophecy conference down there and have us down there. But it was just good to be with him, good to visit with him, and I appreciate your forbearance in allowing me to be gone last Sunday, but I appreciate Brady stepping in and filling in, and, and I heard some good things. I'm glad he's not, he's not in here. I want to talk about him. 
Um, heard some good things about how he preached and God used him and uh, he'll more than likely be here Wednesday night uh, in my stead because we'll probably be out of town. I don't, know, I don't know all the particulars yet, so I don't know when we're leaving, when we're coming back. But I've just made plans and I appreciate him. But I preached this last Sunday, uh, last Sunday night down there and um, it was a message that I'd heard Brother Reg preach years ago and I've just kind of done some different things with it. And there was a verse, a part that wasn't what I preached last Sunday, but it was just part of, uh, it's been on my mind this week, it has a lot to do with Mother's Day and so on, so I'm going to use it this morning. First Kings 21, are you there? Say amen. It came to pass uh, after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard. Now I want you to think about the symbolism of a vineyard. I want you to think about what it is, and think about somebody's land, property, think about what people would get from a vineyard. They get grapes, they get sweet things from it. I like... I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of uh, sour grapes. I just don't like sour things. But what's those kind of grapes that don't have the seeds in them and they're full of, full of meat? That's what I like. Just chew on them all day long. I like raisins. Amen. I like grape juice. I don't drink wine. I don't think you ought to, but I like it. And it said, so think about that. Jez, he had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Syria. That means that it was right next door to Ahab's house. Ahab spake unto Nabal, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a, well, look at those words there, a better vineyard than it. And I want you to think about this morning, think about what God has given you. What God has given you. And the devil would love to get you to trade it in, to turn it over to him and let him have it. He would love for that to happen. And there's a process that goes on. And I may illustrate that here in a little bit. Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs because it is near unto my house and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee, look at that phrase, the worth of it in money. And Lord, just help me to preach this message, Father. I, Lord, I, I couldn't get it settled this week on what to preach. This is the only thing that kept coming up. I'm asking you, God, Lord, to bless my best or my worst efforts this morning, but bless these people. They've come here, Lord. They're on a long journey through life, and they need help from heaven this morning. That's why we're in church. And Lord, I know, God, that the weakness of my flesh... And, uh, Lord, just everything that's going on with me, Father, Lord, I don't have anything to give them, but they need bread this morning. And I pray, dear God, Lord, would you rise and would you give us bread that we may have it, Lord, for our journey that we can keep going. Lord, bless your people, honor your word, God, and speak to our hearts and deal with us, dear God, about what is precious to us. We ask you this favor in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said... Amen. I want you to look down in verse 5, and I want you to notice Jezebel, his wife. Nobody ever marries a woman named Jezebel. No one ever gives birth to a daughter and names her Jezebel. Usually that name is given probably about 15 years later. Amen? 20 years later, something like that. But that she was the original. All through the scriptures, you can see this strange woman. She's Jezebel. She is, uh, she's Rahab. She is uh, Delilah. She is Herodias. She is the one who wanted John the Baptist's head cut off. Do you know why she wanted John the Baptist's head cut off? It wasn't because of his politics. It wasn't because he had money. It wasn't because anything other than he preached the word of God to Herod the king. And he said, Herod, you got your, brother, you got your brother's wife to, to be your wife. And he said, that's against law and you're not supposed to do that. John the Baptist said what needed to be said because he was the man of God. And he was just giving scripture out. And this woman hated his guts for it, and she said, I want John. She used her daughter, she used her daughter to dance seductively to her own husband. And while he got turned on by that, he, he said, he, he asked her, he said, you name anything you want me to give you, and I'll give it to you. And she went to her mama, and she said, you tell him I want John the Baptist's head on a charger. And that's what, that's what happened. And Herod, it grieved him in his heart. But he had already fallen in love with, this, with his wife's daughter and wanted her. That strange woman for you. Somebody say amen. That's, and you know what? 
Maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago in this country, we would have went gasp. Oh, oh, that's bad. Oh, who's ever heard anything like that? I guarantee you, we live in a world right now, that stuff's going on right and left. We live in a wicked, adulterous, perverse generation. Women are turning their daughters into whores and harlots and Jezebels and everything else in the world, and they need the gospel preached to them. Somebody say amen. Amen. But that's her. She runs all throughout the scriptures. You can see her. The culmination of her is Mystery Babylon the Great. She is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. If you want to picture that, go read Ezekiel chapter 16. Do that after church. Do that right before you have your Mother's Day dinner. All right? That'll, that might help you. But anyway, you see Jezebel, she said, His wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? He said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if, I, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will, I, will, I will not give thee my vineyard. Look at verse 7. Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Jezebel does not own Naboth's vineyard. How does she plan to get it? The Bible then will give you instruction on how she works. She thinks nothing about anybody else except her, her power, her gain, her control, her life, she operates behind the scenes. You know what she did? She wrote letters, not in her name, not in uh, signed Jezebel. She didn't put her seal on it. She wrote letters in her husband's name and had them sent all over the area saying, Naboth, he's, a, he's blasphemed God. We ought to kill him. She had him brought up. She had two false witnesses, the Bible calls sons of Belial, had them come up and testify against him. And they killed Naboth, and she got that vineyard from him and gave it to her husband and said, Here you go. She's a thief. She's a murderer. She will, she will do nothing but to kill and destroy and to steal, and she's after your vineyard. That's her role. It took me years to figure this out. Lord, what, what is the role of Babylon? What is the role of Jezebel? How, does, how is it she works in a church or in a home or in a nation? How is it she works inside of a marriage? How is it? The, what, what is her purpose? What does she do? Here's the devil, and he wants what's yours. He wants your marriage. He wants your family. Hey, the devil wants your children. He'll use anything in the world to get to your children. The devil loves to sing songs to your children to corrupt their mind against the instruction of their father and their mother. Do you believe that? Say amen. The devil loves to write books and comic books and show movies to your children. The devil loves to hire school teachers that are telling your children that God's dead, that, that you came from monkeys, that the Bible's not real. You don't need that faith in your mom and dad. Bill Nye, the science guy, did you see that guy? That rascal got on there with that little stupid looking bow tie of his, made a YouTube video, and he said, if you older people, if you want to go ahead and believe in God, believe in creation, then you just go ahead and do that. I'll leave you alone. But leave us your kids. We need your kids to be engineers and physicists and scientists. We need your children trained right to know that they, that they do, were not created by God. They do not have a purpose on this earth. We need to control your children's mind. That's what that little nice guy with that bow tie said. That is mystery Babylon the Great going after your children to turn their head and their minds away from the Word of God. Is it working today? It's working. Some of you mothers, the doodads are to go up on your neck. When so Listen, if one of you moms saw some predator after your daughter, after your son... You'd go after that rascal. You'd want to kill him. You'd want to go after him and say, you stay away from my child. You stay away from my children. You keep your hands off. You keep your mind to yourself. You keep your mouth shut when you're... Listen, it, it still, I still get mad. When I'm at somewhere with, my, with little Caleb and, I'm, and I hear some guy dropping F-bombs and S-H's and D's everywhere, I just go... Rrr. And if they're within earshot, I'll say, stop using that language around these children. I mean, they'll go. 
I've only had one person apologize. One guy at McDonald's stared me down. And I stared him out the door. I don't want him listening. I don't want him thinking that it's okay to say that stuff. You know what? I don't say it at home. It's not okay. Somebody say amen. amen. That is my vineyard. I am responsible for how fruitful that vine turns out. That is my work, my role, my job. If I preach to 100,000 people a month and I don't bless and be a blessing and a proper daddy to my own children, what have I gained? If I gain the whole world and lose the vineyard that I have at home, what have I gained? I've gained absolutely nothing. It's my responsibility to raise my children and to teach them the right way. It's my responsibility to be a husband to my wife. And she is as much a blessing to me. I want to be as much or more of a blessing to her. Those are my vineyards. Let me, let me give you a verse to help illustrate this. Turn to Psalm 128 if you would. Psalm 128. The title of this message is Don't Sell Your Vineyard, the Bethel Version. So far in my notes, I've got Don't Sell Your Vineyard, the Harrison Version. Don't Sell Your Vineyard, the Norwood Version. And this, this is Don't Sell Your Vineyard, the Bethel Version of it. And I, I am. I'm preaching it different ways in different places. But that's, you can do that with the Word of God. Psalm 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord. Somebody say amen to that. That walketh in his ways. You know what his ways are? You're holding them in your hand. That when, it's, that when it says don't go to the left, then don't go to the left. And by the way, your wife is better at that than anybody in the world. Don't, no, don't turn here. Don't, no, just go straight. Pull over and ask that man there where we are. That's why... Those Garmin GPSs you put in your car, what kind of voice is that on there? That's a woman's voice, isn't it? Turn, now turn, no, turn left. Now we've got to recalculate the whole thing. <laughs> Amen. Hey, just think about the church being a woman. And it is. In the Bible, the church is a woman. The church, especially Bethel Church, we're like Rahab. We were out doling around to everything that was out there and we heard about the destruction coming and we decided we didn't want any part of it and we asked God to save us. Somebody say amen. amen. That's Bethel Church. And so you know what? God's given us a little bit of wisdom here in this church. I don't say that we use it all the time, but at least he's given it to us. He's given us a little bit of wisdom and what comes out of this church is us. You go read, do what I did. Go read Proverbs. What, it, what, it, what our job is in this church is to cry out in the streets and try to impart wisdom to this lost and dying world that has no sense left whatsoever. Amen? We have no sense in this country, and this church ought to be out crying out wisdom in the streets, trying to impart wisdom everywhere, and we're trying to instruct people in the right way. And it's not that we have come into this church, we've never done anything wrong. We read in the book that certain things are wrong, and we say you shouldn't do that. We've come into this church because we have done everything that this Bible told us not to do. That's what we did. And we're coming in here and trying to send a message out that says, will you please at least listen to us like you would listen to your mother? We've been down this road. It's not any different now than it was 20 years ago. Sin is still sin. Danger is still danger. And all of that stuff out in the world is dangerous and it's no good. And the devil wants to kill you. Somebody say amen. That's our message. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. That means that you'll work, guys... And you'll get to participate in eating of what you labored for. And here we go. And the government won't take all of it away from you. You mark it down. God is cursing this nation with taxes. Can you get amen? God is cursing and judging this nation with taxes. You know why? We do not walk in God's way anymore. 
we are not able to eat of the labor of our own hands until after the month of May. Everything that you earn, if you gave it to the government first, it would take you from January until May to pay off the debt to the government in taxes, and then from June on, you could keep the rest. You just think about how right this Bible is while you're, while you're mad at me. This Bible is right. Thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Just ask yourself the question, is it well in America? Who outside of this nation hates our guts? Lots and lots of nations. Who inside this nation hates our guts? Lots of people. Then he said in verse 3, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Your wife or your mother is blessed by God Number one, in childbearing, God gave you the gift of bearing children. God gave you the, ch uh, the gift of nurturing children. It is not for men to be nice to babies. I mean, when I was younger, I bent a little bit. I'm older, I come in here every day. There's Lindsay and Alicia and Courtney and all these birdie mouths open. And as long as they're feeding them, everybody's fine. I come and give a little tickle and, and play with them a little bit and get their piggies and have all kinds of good time. By the time they get up to Rose's office, it's scream, holler, fuss, moan, whine, complain. It stinks. And I'm going, I'm going upstairs. I love you guys. Try to get something done today, okay? It's not for us. God gave that to women to be able to nurture those children and they do it better than we do guys somebody say amen okay God will bless your family with a wife who will be as a fruitful vine and by the way ladies your job's not done when you give birth to the child your job is not done all the way down even into the great grandchildren your job is still there and still valid can I hear you say amen I look at my, my daughters, and I'm looking at my grandchildren. I still call them mine because they are. They are from my body. They have issued from my bowels, the Bible says. And when those children grow up and have children of their own, they will still be mine. They will call me great-grandfather if I'm around to see that day. And my job to those great-grandchildren will be just as important as my job in raising our children was. It is to be the patriarch over that group and to lead those great-grandchildren into the same righteousness and the same help for salvation that God led me into a hundred years ago. If he allows me to live, that's what I want to be able to tell my children. Can somebody say amen? Now let me tell you something. That is a, that is a vineyard worth hanging on to. So let me just let me just preach this. I was going to I'm running out of time here, and I've been just been enjoying the, the presence of the Lord. Let me just preach this for a minute. Let me preach to the men. Men, don't sell your vineyard. Don't sell your vineyard. Your wife and your children are your vineyard. I went home yesterday. Who, who, I, I like to watch these cop shows and these law shows, these courtroom shows. Anybody with me? Cops catching bad guys, okay? All those bad guys on those shows, black, white, makes no difference. They have sold their vineyard. One guy, he got arrested. This was on bait car. He got arrested. He had, I like how they try to lie about it. Yeah, that, my uncle dropped that off for me. Wanted me to take that out to his house. And one guy said, Ah, 
I was going to take it down to a chop shop, I know. And the cops are going, where's the chop shop? Cleveland, um, he knew what was, he said, I got kids to take care of. Then why aren't you home taking care of your children, trying to find honest work somewhere, and there is still honest work in this country. Somebody say, if you don't believe that, ask the people who've come up from Mexico. They found all kinds of honest work up in this country that we think we're too good to do anymore. Amen. Boys, don't sell your vineyard. Don't sell your vineyard. Number one, your wife is your vine. God will bless you and she'll be a fruitful vine on the sides of your house. She will be the crown of your life. If you will live your life the way God tells you to live this life. And don't let Jezebel tell you that there is a better vineyard out there somewhere. Because just about every man thinks in his mind, even if it's for a second, especially when he's not so happy with his wife, that there is another woman out there who will be a better wife to him than the one he's got. Don't sell your vineyard. Amen? My mom and dad, by the grace of Almighty God, stayed together. I don't know everything about my mom and dad. Don't want to know everything about my mom and dad. I do know that there was times when my mom and dad would be in serious talks. I don't know what, out, what about. I don't want to know what about. But I know that there was probably times when my mom and dad could have busted up. Maybe some of you sitting here today are from a home where mom and dad busted up. God, by His grace, kept my mom and dad together. And my dad, my dad, is in heaven today because even though he might have been tempted to sell his vineyard, he kept that fruitful vine by the side of his house. And it was my mother's testimony and my mother leaning on him and my mother praying for him that led my dad to be broken before God and say, God, deliver me from beer, from Mogan David wine, and from everything else that is killing me. God, deliver me. And God delivered my dad, and I'm, he is waiting for me when I get there. By God's grace, my dad did not sell out my mother for a better vineyard. Don't sell your vineyard for money or for gain. I know God commands us to work and to labor and to work hard and I think you ought to work hard. Amen? Because if you don't, you work less and demand more money and then your plan will be shut down next like Chrysler. Just ask him guys what happened to their factory. They worked less, demanded more, so who's building your cars? We're south. That's who's building all your vehicles. Don't sell them out for money. Ladies, the world we live in right now is just as much of a wicked draw to women as it is to men. By way of movies, TVs, music, and the internet. It is out there. It is a draw. You wives will have it in your mind that there just may be someone, a better husband or a better man for you, even if it's temporary for you. Don't sell your vineyard. Moms and dads, don't sell your children. You say, well, I've, I've got all my children. 
Don't sell them, number one, to, um, who can I pick on? Lady Gaga, um, Katy Perry. Give me some country music, boys. All I know is Willie Nelson, Johnny Cash, and... Some of you are going, I ain't going to because he'll know I've been listening. <laughs> Don't sell your children out to the world. Don't sell your children out to let them sit around and play video games for four hours a day every day. Don't, unless they are going to grow up and own a software company that makes video games, they are wasting their time. Don't, this is, this is just same old preaching that preachers used to do a long time ago, back when it was easy. Don't sell your children out to the lies the public school is telling. The Missouri legislature right now is voting to scrap the Common Core curriculum in the state of Missouri and throw it out because it doesn't work. You pray that they get to do that. It's a joke. It's godless. It's... it's right-brained instead of logical. It's all about make-believe stuff instead of making them think right. You pray that they get to throw it out. But don't, even if you're, I, listen, we used to run a school here. I never pressured anybody in my church to put their kids in my school. We don't have the school anymore. We homeschool some kids here. I don't pressure anybody because homeschooling is not for everybody. It's hard to do. It's not easy. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of dedication. But I'm telling you, moms and dads, go home and read Deuteronomy 6. It is not the public school's job to train your children about what's right and wrong. That's your job. In fact, they're going to learn it wrong. They're going to learn it that it's okay for men to touch them. They're going to learn that it's okay for two men to get married and kiss each other on the mouth. And lots of other things that the Bible says is wrong. That's, what, that's the morality they're going to learn in your school. It is not the school's job, it's not the government's job to do what it is, the home's job. It is mom and dad's job to teach them the Word of God. Mom and dad, are you teaching your children the Word of God? Or have you sold them out to the world? That's your vineyard. That's what Ahab wants. And I guarantee you, Jezebel has a plan to get him. And then I'm just going to say this and I'm going to be done. Don't sell out your church. The church is a vineyard. It is, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. See how simple that is? I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and he said, my words abide in you, the same bring forth much fruit. It becomes more and more of a burden upon me the older I get and the longer I've been pastoring here. It becomes more and more difficult for me to preach certain things that over the years I have found out some of you don't like. It becomes hard for me to do that. You know why? I want you to stay. I want you to like me. I want you to love me. I want you to think that I'm going to try to find out what God wants us to know and then preach it. I also want you to think that if it's good for the geese, it's good for the gander. That's what I want you to think. And I'm asking you, don't sell this vineyard. Don't ask for a different Bible in this church. Don't ask for a different way of delivering. Don't ask for different messages. Don't ask for Rick Warren to come hold a conference down here. Or Joyce. Don't ask for us to go to the Youth with a Mission conference. Don't ask us to go to the... Christian rock concert. Don't ask for these things because I'm not going. This vineyard is mine and it's mine to protect and I have to protect the vineyard. Can I hear you say amen? amen. This, is what's gonna, this Bible is what's going to keep us all together fellowshipping in the, shame, in the same ship together. Amen? This is what's going to keep us here. Let's not sell it out for the popularity, what's, what we hear on the radio, what all the other churches in town are doing. Don't ask us to sell that out either to get more money or, well, what they're doing is actually better 
than what we're doing. We had, a, we had a man here years ago came to us and immediately started making demands on me and the pastor at the time of how he wanted everything for his family. And the pastor would kind of cater to him a little bit and every time he would talk, he would say, you know, Brother Mike, at some of the other churches we went to, they kind of did it this way, and they always did it kind of like this, and that's kind of how they did it over here. And the first thing in my mind, Sterling, was, why are you here? If all of those other churches that you went to were so much better than how we do things here, why in the world are you doing here? Now, I never said that to him. wasn't mean to him at all. I promise you I wasn't. But he didn't stick around very... We made all the accommodations for him and his family to make him comfortable. Down the road he went. Okay? Don't sell this vineyard. Don't sell it out. Don't... I don't even know what to tell you to do. Just don't. This place is very precious to a lot of us people here. Can I hear you say amen? amen. We'd like to keep it God's way. We need your prayers. Amen? We need your prayers. Would you stand to your feet?